Well, we're in Acts chapter 1 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 21 through 26, finishing up uh, chapter 1 of Acts. Hard to believe we're already going to be in chapter 2. Lord willing, two weeks from now. This is part two of a a two-part sermon in this last section of Acts. And we were looking at the phrase last time, let another take his office. Let another take his office. That was the prophecy that Peter had spoken from Psalm 109. Let another take his office. And if you weren't with us last time and you don't know whose office we're talking about or what that office is, we're talking about Judas, the one who shall not be named. Scripture had to be fulfilled. Judas is dead. Judas is no longer one of of the twelve and so another must take his apostleship now if you were living back with jesus if you were one of the eleven that was left you might be tempted to think something you might be tempted to think jesus blew it i mean he picked out of all the people he could have these twelve people and he blew it he picked judas I mean, he's Jesus. How could he not have known? How could he not, how could he not have seen it coming? I saw the signs, didn't you? Uh, I, I knew the kind of person that Judas was, right? Hindsight's always twenty twenty for us armchair quarterbacks, and so we look back and, and, and we think, oh, we saw the signs. How could they be so dumb? Perhaps that's what some of the apostles may have been tempted to think. Perhaps it's what we may be tempted to think, but we would never say it. When we look around the world, or even perhaps at our own lives, and you see lost jobs, careers, broken marriages, wayward children, pastors who have failed or turned into wolves in sheep's clothing, friends who have stabbed you in the back and deserted the faith very quickly we become sad or anxious or just very discouraged. We ask ourselves, could that have been God's plan? Could that have really been God's plan? Or does he just have the cards stacked against me? But actually, frankly, most of the time, could this be God's plan as an afterthought? We just plunge ourselves into the depths of despair or into anger and bitterness when things don't go right. We tend to blame God rather than even asking the question, could this be God's plan? Well, if I could present one specimen to you who could have asked a very similar question, it would be a man by the name of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet in the Old Testament who was commanded to go and marry a woman named Gomer. And if you know the the story of Hosea, then you know that Gomer was not a good woman. She was a woman of the night, as it were. And yet, God commanded Hosea to marry Gomer. Well, he did. But if marriage wasn't bad enough, it's what came next that could have caused Hosea to truly question God. It's that when Gomer left to follow all of her sinful desires, God told Hosea to take her back. To take her back. Go and get her back. And is Hosea thinking, oh God, you don't know her. You think she can be reformed? She can't. You don't know her like I do. But see, God's plan for Hosea was not an easy marriage. God's plan for Hosea was not restoration of a Christian marriage. It was not for reform. But God did have a plan in using Gomer, and it was this. To show to his chosen people, Israel, that even though they had deserted him, into idolatry, that by his grace, he would take them back. And so Hosea stood back 
perhaps now understanding the true ramifications of the command that God would give him and said, ah, I get it now. But friends, when life throws punches at you, don't you question? Does God know what he's doing? Why would he do this to me? Why would God pick that person? Why would God pick that pastor who's failed? But you all know, if, you, if you've lived for any amount of time, that at some point when you're going through that turmoil, everything seems like a big question mark. But then a year down the road, or five years down the road, or sometimes even 20 years down the road, and all the dust settles, you look back and you go, ah, I see what you were doing. Some of you still don't see what God is doing, and that's okay. But we must understand that though we as humans think that God may have failed, that God might not really know what's going on, that it is God who understands and knows the heart. That he chose every person. That he chose every event in your life. And friends, listen, that God never makes a mistake. Our scene this morning takes place back in the upper room. Peter has, has stood up among the brothers to give this prophecy. Let another take his office. That's Judah, the, Judas, the one with the evil heart. The Gomer of the twelve. Did Jesus make a mistake? No. But now the disciples have a decision to make and it's this. Who will take his place? And so as you go on this journey with me through verses 21 through 26 of Acts chapter 1 this morning, I want you to continue to watch as Christ builds his church, his way, on his timetable with the people that he chooses. And so as the dust settles in the upper room and the memory of Judas is laid to rest, may we see clearly this truth this morning. Trust the heart knower to choose who he wants to accomplish his plans. The title of the sermon this morning is The Venerable Vacancy, Part 2, The Wonderful Beginning of the Witness. Would you look with me, please, at verse 21 of Acts chapter 1. So, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. These few verses are divided up neatly for us really into four parts. And the first part here in verse 21 is called the problem. The problem. What is the problem? Well, it's just been presented to us. There's a vacancy in the 12. There's only 11 of them and that vacancy must be filled. It must be filled. Prophecy must come to pass. That's Psalm 109 verse 8. There must be 12 apostles. That's the problem that we're facing. And we quickly move to the second part of the passage from the problem to the parameters. What are the parameters of of choosing this new individual? What's the criteria by which we should choose this individual? Well, this passage lays out for us the criteria. First of all, we see in verses 21 and 22 that they must have been with the 12 throughout Jesus' entire ministry. And you say, well, what would Jesus' entire ministry include? What's the starting point and the ending point? Well, they lay this out for us. Starting with the baptism of John, Acts 13, 24, reads, before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So that's the starting point. So the parameters to solve the problem is that you must choose someone who was with the 12 apostles beginning at John's baptism. But there's an ending point, and the bookend is the ascension of Jesus, Acts 1, 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And so that's criteria or parameter number one. That whoever you pick must have been with Jesus and the 12 disciples from the baptism of John to the ascension of Jesus Christ. But there's a second parameter. It's found in verse 22. It's the end. With us 
a witness to his resurrection. This person, if they're going to be picked to fill this slot, must have been a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. But there is a third criteria to this office. And by the way, we are going to spend just a little bit of time here on verses 21 and 22, because as we have entered Acts, I told you that we'll be introducing topics for you. And the topic that we're introducing here, and that we'll see all throughout the book of Acts, is, Acts is that of an apostle an apostle, and so we'll be speaking about that a little bit this morning. The third criteria for an apostle is that they would be chosen by God. Now, we don't see that in verses 21 and 22, but we do see it later in this passage. We know that Jesus initially had chosen the 12, which included Judas Iscariot. Mark 3.14 says that. It says, and he appointed 12. So Jesus had chosen them. We know that Jesus chose Paul. Acts chapter 9, verse 15b, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. And so the third criteria to fill this slot is that they must have been chosen by God. The fourth criteria that's also not found in these two verses is signs and wonders. That the apostles must be able to perform signs and wonders in order to prove their apostleship. We find this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 43. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 also says, please listen, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. And so these are the criteria for someone who is able to fill this office, that they must have been with the 12 throughout Jesus' ministry, starting with the baptism of John, ending with the ascension, that they must be witnesses to his resurrection, meaning that they had seen him after he rose from the dead so that they could say, yeah, I saw him, that they must have been chosen directly by God, not by man, and that they must be able to do signs and wonders to prove their true apostleship. Okay, and so as we introduce this topic and before we move on in these verses, I'd like to answer this question for you. What's an apostle? What is an apostle? We're asking that question because this text is trying to fill that office. It's trying to fill that position. And so I suppose as we move on through the text, we ought to know what that means. The word apostles can be translated a couple of different ways, either messenger or also as one who is sent out. Messenger or one who is sent out. And the task or the, the primary goal of an apostle is laid out for us here in verse 22. It's at the end of verse 22, and it's that an apostle would be a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the primary goal of an apostle. Acts chapter 10, verses 40 and 42 speak to this, where it says, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge to be the judge of the living and the dead. And so the primary role of an apostle is laid out for us here in verse 22. That's a witness. But there's more to being an apostle than merely being a witness to his resurrection. The apostles were God's representatives on earth. God's representatives on earth. And thus, as his representatives, much like Jesus was God's representative on earth, the apostles had the authority to speak the word of God. It's very important. The, author the apostles had the authority to speak the very words of God as his representative. Hence, our New Testament. That's why our New Testament is authoritative. These apostles met this criteria. They're the early church in in determining which letters were actually supposed to be what's called canonical, meaning a part of God's word, meaning they were actually inspired by God. They are inerrant and infallible. Well, which ones are they? Well, they had several tests by which they would determine if a book or a letter was canonical, was from God through the pen of a man. And one of the tests was this. 
that the letter or the book must have been written either by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle with that apostle's approval. That was the test. And if, if, if a book or a letter did not meet the test, then it was not inspired. It was not inerrant. It was not infallible. Very important test. Second Peter 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And how could they prove that they were speaking God's word? Signs and wonders of a true apostle. And as authoritative representatives, these apostles could establish the first churches, which we'll be looking at come chapter two after Pentecost, the very first church, Jerusalem Community Church, I suppose, or perhaps Jerusalem Baptist Church, not sure what they were called. Well, as we continue to introduce this topic, I would like to ask two more questions. The first question is this, were there more than 12 apostles? Were there more than 12 apostles? That might be on some of your minds because here we have the number 12, but I mentioned Paul earlier, and so let's answer that one. And secondly, are there still apostles today? And so as we're introducing this topic, let's ask these two questions. First of all, we'll deal with are there more than 12 apostles? Well, we certainly know that there was a future for 12 specifically. Listen, please, as I read Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Matthew 19 and verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's a future for this particular group of of, of 12 that would there be any other apostles would not fit into this number. Also Revelation chapter 21 9. Please listen to this. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so there in Matthew 19 and Revelation 21 we have a future for the 12. But there were others who were called apostle. For instance, Paul. Well, did Paul meet the criteria of an apostle? Well, let's look at it. First of all, he was chosen by God. Acts chapter 26 and verse 15 reads like this, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so Paul was chosen specifically by Christ. Christ says this, and he literally says, I've chosen you to be a witness, the very same goal, primary goal of the 12 apostles that we see in Acts 1 and verse 22. But we have even more scriptural proof in 1 Timothy 1.12 that Paul was chosen, where we read, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Also in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay, so he was chosen, chosen by God. That seems very clear. Well, let's, let's move on to another qualification. Did Paul see the risen Christ? Acts chapter nine and verse five. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Also, 1 Corinthians nine, verse one. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so certainly Paul was chosen by Christ. He saw Christ, but he also claims to be an apostle. You heard that in two passages, but let's go to Romans 1.1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. 
Furthermore, not only did he claim to be apostle, but he was recognized as an apostle, Galatians 2, 6. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And so not only was he chosen by Christ, he saw Christ, he claims to be an apostle, it was verified by others that he was an apostle. But what about John's baptism? What about John's baptism in those three years that, that, that he had to fit this criteria to, to be there with the 12 from the baptism of John uh, up until the ascension of Jesus Christ? You say, well, Paul wasn't. Paul wasn't there, so he doesn't meet those criteria. Okay, I'm gonna throw one little curveball at you and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on a little bit to somebody else. But in Galatians uh, chapter one, and we won't go through the entire passage today, I'll let you go and look at it. We are taught that Paul was taught the gospel directly from Jesus Christ. And now in verse 17 of Galatians chapter one, we are told that Paul didn't go back to Jerusalem for a certain period of time. In fact, first he went to Arabia and then he went to Damascus. And prior to returning to Jerusalem, there was a period of three years. Three years. Now, if you were to look at the ministry of Jesus and the fact that the, uh, the qualifications or the criteria for an apostle must be that they were with the 12 from the baptism of John all the way to the ascension, that would have been a three-year time span. And so Paul indeed was taught the gospel by Jesus in Arabia and Damascus for three years, potentially fulfilling this qualification. Otherwise, you might say that Paul could be an apostle, but the 12, specifically the 12 that were going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 whose names will be inscribed on the foundations of heaven, they had to meet those specific criteria in order to be in that group of 12, but not Paul or later, later apostles. But to sum up Paul's apostleship, I would say that of all those in Scripture that are mentioned as apostles, Paul's seems to be the most clear Okay, uh, so we move on from there to other apostles, and I'll tell you this, the word apostle is a generic term. It can either be speaking of the specific office that, that's being filled here in Acts chapter one, um, or it can, it can be just speaking of someone who is a messenger or sent out. So we find it in John chapter 13 and verse 16, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. That's the word apostle. Well, there's two other words that are also generic, angel and deacon. Angel and deacon. Jesus is actually called a deacon and an apostle. He's called an apostle in Hebrews chapter three and verse one, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, though they aren't trying to say that Jesus fits into the office of an apostle, okay? Furthermore, John the Baptist in Mark chapter one and verse two was called an angel, though it's translated as messenger. But just to show that these three words also can be used generically, not specifically speaking of an office. Just as much as Jesus didn't hold the office of a deacon, though he was called a servant, John was not a heavenly being. There are other apostles mentioned, Barnabas in Acts chapter 13 and verse two. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In Acts 14, 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out. We have others in Romans chapter 16 and verse seven, Andronicus and, and Junia, potentially apostles, and that could put us potentially at 16 apostles. We have Titus in 2 Corinthians 8.23 with the word apostle used, though translated as, as messenger. We have Epaphroditus in Philippians 2.25 that could put us at 18 apostles. We have James in 1 Corinthians 15.7 and Galatians 1.19, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, which could put us at 19 apostles and then we have Apollos in, in 1 Corinthians 4 9 and I'll just tell you this 
we don't know how many apostles there were, all right? And, uh, and, and, and if you, you know, someone invariably is going to come up afterward and say, yes, we do. And, and, and if I get two different people that say, yes, we do, that one person will say there were only 12 and somebody else is going to say there were 20, okay? Uh, and uh, I, I think Paul's might be the, the clearest example of another apostle outside of the 12, uh, but certainly the 12 was a very specific number that had to meet the criteria laid out in Acts and perhaps, perhaps the only criteria that later apostles did not need to meet was the idea that they must have been with the disciples for that three-year period beginning with John's baptism and ending at the ascension. That would be the only criteria. Okay, so you say, why did you go off on that? And you're reading so fast and, and whatnot. Well, you know what? Here's why. Because I want to answer the second question. Are there apostles today? Are there apostles today? And, that, and that's, why, that's why that criteria is so important. That's why studying, is, is Paul actually an apostle? That's why it's so important. Because wouldn't you know it but there are many religions and Christian denominations who would say, yes, the office of apostle continues today. And so let us answer that question as we begin to take a journey through the book of Acts because we will light upon it once again. If there are apostles today, I want you to know something. They must, of necessity, claim apostolic authority for there is no other apostle they must claim to speak for God his word as his representative for we have no other example of any other apostle friends this is dangerous this is dangerous now those in the camp today that believe in apostolic succession, meaning that there are still apostles today. Their reasoning is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. I'll read verses 11 and 12 of Ephesians chapter 4 for you. Please listen. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. And so those in the camp that believe there are still apostles today would go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and they would say, see, the office exists. The office of apostle still exists today for the building up of the body of Christ and the equipping of the saints. Okay. We also know that some of these offices absolutely can be past tense. In fact, we read about such an office, apostle, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And so when you arrive then two chapters later at Ephesians chapter 4, you find apostles and prophets, and yet it was a former office the cornerstone, the foundation on which the church was built. The apostles laid the foundation and the laying of the foundation equips the saints. But friends, there's big problems with claims of apostleship. apostleship. You know why? You can't speak against them. Think about that. You cannot speak against an apostle. You can't question their authority. Now, there is no better example of apostolic succession than what is found in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church believes that the Pope is a direct successor of the Apostle Peter. Thus, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church believes that he can speak what is called ex cathedra or from the chair, the very words of God, and that he has that authority, and that no one can question what he says because it's from God. Furthermore, if you've ever heard the term bishop, which we believe is simply synonymous with elder or pastor, all three terms referring to one office in the church, in the Catholic church, they separate the word bishop as a separate office, and they believe that the bishop is indeed not an apostle per se, but rather a successor of the 12 apostles. 
And so through apostolic succession comes bishops who have authority over many churches and are God's authoritative representatives on earth. That's a problem, friends. Because if somebody can claim to speak the very words of God and you can't question them, that's a problem. There may have been other apostles now you see where I was going with all. There may have been other apostles. Maybe you can number 20 in there if you want to. If you really want to stretch the New Testament, you might be able to squeeze 20 into that, that jar of apostles. But the Bible does not teach apostolic succession. In fact, it's an entire argument from silence. All right, well then let's go. Let's make a counter-argument from silence. If you want to make an argument from silence, Paul said that he was chosen last of all. And so my argument from silence is that there is no apostolic succession. Furthermore, there were no other apostles after Paul was chosen. Any argument from silence must take that into account. Furthermore, there's no biblical record of another apostle being replaced other than in our passage this morning. James one of the apostles was martyred in Acts chapter 12. We'll get there in a few years. And there was no successor to James. The only successor is Matthias that made up the 12 specifically. And so any argument from silence is after the 12th spot was filled, succession ceased. Okay? Furthermore, nobody today meets the criteria. Show me an eyewitness to the resurrection. The church is already established. Ephesians 2.20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Furthermore, chosen by Jesus? Chosen by God? No, no. You cannot prove that you were chosen by God. Why? Fourth criteria, no signs and wonders. There cannot be an apostle today. They are not eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. They cannot prove that they were chosen by God. They cannot perform signs and wonders to do such. So whether it's an argument from silence or an argument from the book itself, 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Okay, friends, and so that is our introduction to the topic of apostles as we light upon it here in verses 21 and, uh, 21 and 22 of Acts 1. And so we have the problem. What's the problem? The vacancy has to be filled. There's only 11. We have the parameters. They must be a witness of the resurrection. And so now we must see who meets the parameters to be the 12th guy. Verse 23. And they put forward Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Now go ahead and tell you, we don't know much about either of these guys. In fact, this is the only time either of them are mentioned. There was a, a historian named Eusebius that lived in the early 300s, and he wrote that Matthias was one of the 70 disciples found in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, which reads like this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two in every town and place where he himself was about to go. It appears, perhaps, that Joseph and Matthias were the only two that met all of the criteria here. And so here's two guys. And boy, oh boy, did we choose the 12th one wrong last time. Or rather, Jesus did. Judas. So this time, down to these two men, how will they choose? Verse 24. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you 
have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And so how will they choose? They won't. And we come to the third part of our passage this morning. We have the problem, the parameters, and now the prayer. They know what the criteria is, but they want God to choose. Why not them? Why don't they just pick? Human limitations. Human limitations. Humans don't know the heart. But look again, please, at verse 24. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all. Friends, this is key. This is key to our text this morning. You, Lord, who know the heart. Trust the heart knower who chooses who he wants to accomplish his plans. How often has man chosen incorrectly? Oh, we know that we have. Oh man, we choose incorrectly all the time. Because of our human limitations, we can't look into the heart. Think of Jesse's sons, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is, this, this is both an encouragement, but it also ought to serve as a warning that God can be the heart reader. Deuteronomy 8, 2, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Because God knows our hearts, he prays for us, Romans 8 and verse 27, and he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Well, friends, then, if God knew the heart of Judas, he knew he was pilfering from the money bag. I'll do you one better. He knew that he was going to pilfer from the money bag. Did he make a mistake? No. 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 Think back in your mind's eye to John chapter two and verse 24 when Jesus is on the the streets of Jerusalem doing miracles for the very first time and we read in John 2, 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Revelation chapter two and verse 23, and I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. Psalm 17, three, you have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Psalm 44, verse 21, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. So then what happened with Judas? How do we explain that? If God didn't make a mistake, if God somehow didn't, he he knew Judas' heart and, and still picked him, how do we explain that? Easy. Friends, listen to me. God uses evil people to accomplish his plans. God uses evil people to accomplish his plans. A spiritual leader falls. I've seen it. You've seen it. Walk away from the faith. Faith. What happened? How do we not see it coming? How do we not protect the church? Look at all the, the damage that's been caused. I want to tell you something. God put him there. God uses evil people to accomplish his plans. Judas went to his own place. But now, it doesn't excuse our sinful choices mind you. Just because God uses sinful people, we can't excuse their sin. The sin is evil, but God uses it. Evil hearts do not stop the heart knower. Oh, what a wonderful truth. Friends, what a wonderful truth. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You cannot mock the heart knower. He knows exactly what is inside of you. He knows exactly what thoughts you thought 
on your pillow last evening. I wonder, as I hear a pin drop in here, if there is anyone with a black, evil, unbelieving heart. I can't see your heart. Frankly, I don't want to. But God knows. We in this room don't. But God knows. I've seen and heard of black hearts, evil hearts, hearts that have not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, hearts that have not been made new. Be in a church, grow up in a church, grow up in a Christian home at some point in their adult life. They raise their hand and say, I bow in humility before my sovereign God, repenting of my sin and believing in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord who died on the cross and rose from the dead for me. I've seen it. You've probably seen it. And yet all the while, they had a black heart. Friends, I don't know if that's you. I hope it's not. I don't know if you're watching or or listening and you've not had a heart that's been made new by Jesus Christ. He wants to. He wants to do that in your heart and he can and he will even right now. And if you would come to him in repentant faith, turning from your sin and your self-rule and turning to Jesus, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, I have news for you, you'll be saved right away, instantly, and your heart will be made new. The heart knower can see inside of you. That's my prayer for you. Would you believe today? You can do it right now. You can do it later on. If you want to talk to me about it, please do. It's my greatest desire in this church that many men and women would come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And so, friends, we've seen the problem, the parameters, the prayer that God would choose someone to take Judah's place in the ministry of apostleship. And now we come to the fourth and final part of our passage this morning, the promotion. Which of the two disciples will be promoted to the office of apostle? They asked God to show them which one he chose. Verse 26. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Friends, the 12th apostle is Matthias. God chose, God chose through lots. This is a biblically sanctioned method. If you'll remember Leviticus 16 and verse eight, and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Joshua commanded the casting of lots regarding the dividing up of the land. Joshua 18, verse six, and you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The musicians were chosen by lots in 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 8, and they cast lots for their duty, small and great, teacher and pupil alike. The gatekeepers in 1 Chronicles 26 and verse 13 were chosen by lots, and they cast lots by fathers' houses, small and great alike, for their gates. And of course, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 explains for us what we saw there in Chronicles and Joshua and at Leviticus, Proverbs 16, 33 reads, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. God ordained the casting of lots in the Old Testament to determine his will. Now we don't know much about what the casting of lots looked like. Likely names were written on stones and put into an earthen vessel, shaken about and poured out onto the ground and the first stone that came out was the individual who would be chosen. However, if you have in your mind, should we still decide things by the casting of lots today, I will tell you something very interesting about this verse. That in Acts chapter 1 and verse 26, this is the final time in all of the New Testament that the casting of lots is either executed or even mentioned. And so no. 
We do not throw dice and claim it's from God. This is not something we are told to do, commanded to do, or even told how to do. But under the God-given authority of Peter, they could. Now I want to deal with something very small that some of you might come up and ask me about if I don't deal with it now. Okay? Some suggest that Matthias is not a rightful apostle. Those that would wish to squeeze the number to 12, which is fine. I'm happy for there to be only 12 apostles, but some would suggest Matthias is not a rightful apostle. And they would suggest that, that Peter stood up and was acting of his own will, not of God's will, and that God made the choice of Paul. He was the rightful 12. Okay, briefly deal with this. There's nothing in this passage indicating that God didn't choose or that they were acting of their own will. If they were acting of their own will, Peter's entire speech must be of his own will, and we can't be sure then of the prophecies that he spoke, whether they are related to Judas at all in Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 verse 8, or of the qualifications for apostleship. And so we must undo everything that was said in his his speech to the disciples. Furthermore, Scripture leads us to believe that the prayer of the apostles was in fact answered by God. Scripture leads us to believe that Peter is speaking under divine inspiration, and Luke, the author of our book, records all of this scene without caveat. Also, Paul claimed apostleship, but he never outed Matthias. Furthermore, the Spirit at Pentecost comes upon Matthias, and he speaks in tongues. Furthermore, later Luke refers to this group as the 12, Acts 6-2, and the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve in tables. And so, whose name will be found on that 12th and final foundation stone of the new Jerusalem? Friends, likely it is Matthias. And so we have the problem a vacancy. The parameters, witnesses to the resurrection. We have the prayer that the heart knower would choose, and we have the promotion that God filled the final spot for Pentecost, and what do we learn? Friends, that God knows exactly what he's doing, and exactly who he's picking in your life and in mine, and just exactly what he's fulfilling in his perfect plan at any given moment. And so when the worst thing happens to you that you could possibly imagine, God had it planned all along. God had it planned all along. Sometimes we see that later, after years. The dust settles and you realize that all the worry and the discouragement and the questioning of God, it was silly. You understand that God knew the heart of every person, that God chose every person, that he chose every event in your situation, and that he never makes a mistake. And so I leave you with this. Trust the heart knower who chooses who he will to accomplish his plans. And if your life turns into something as bad as Hosea's or Jesus, you just keep doing what's right and trust that God is building his church, his kingdom, and you into just exactly what he wants. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for building your church. We thank you for saving us through the ministry of the apostles. We thank you for equipping us through the ministry of the apostles. What a joy to study your word, to see the foundation that you laid, to see that you chose these men to be your earthly authoritative representatives to declare your word, to establish churches such that 2,000 years later we can still participate in the ministry that they started. But God, as we have come face to face with the knowledge that you are the heart knower, oh, may we search our intentions even as we have accused you time and time again, perhaps even unwittingly. 
wondering, suspecting that you may not know what you're doing. Oh God, you know, and we praise you that you use even evil people to accomplish your plans because your plans are far greater than us. We are nothing and we only ask that we might be able to suffer with Christ, that we may also be risen with him. It's in his name we pray, amen.